As you are being seated, if you would, turn with me to the book of James. This morning, Chuck and I are starting a new series on the book of James. We've subtitled it, A Faith That Works. If you're familiar with the book, then you understand sort of the the subtitle there. If you're not familiar with the book, I hope to flesh that out as we work our way on Sunday mornings through it. This morning, specifically, the title of my message is A Humble Servant, and I'm going to be focusing on verse 1. So James 1, verse 1. If I were to stand on the top of this church, and at the edge of the building, look off, and want to jump off, there is one fundamental element of nature that I must take into account. Granted, there would be several, but there's one that we're all thinking of. Gravity. Now, I could have some sort of teenage rebellion, right? And say, well, forget gravity. It doesn't boss me around. It doesn't tell me what to do. And jump off. But what's going to happen? I'm still going to fall. Because gravity still exists. It just is. If I don't like gravity, it doesn't matter. It just exists. And it has many different sort of um, uh, implications upon our life and our existence. For example, though your measuring devices and my measuring devices can't measure the difference, if you were to stand on the top of this steeple, the time would actually be a little minutely slower than if you were to stand on the floor. Because time is gauged, if you will, by gravity. The stronger the gravity, the slower the time. Less gravity, quicker the time. As a matter of fact, our engineers, when they're making satellites, they have to calculate this. When they're making the satellite, the idea, the variation of time when you're on the ground versus in space. Gravity just is. If I didn't like it, it doesn't matter. Another element that I think we need to take into consideration and something that just is whether we like it or not and something that I want to draw out this morning from this passage is this. Is that you, me, every human being that has existed, that does exist and will exist is either a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. Let me say that again because this is my overarching theme this morning. Is that every single human being that has ever existed, does exist, will exist. Is either a slave to sin or they are a slave to Christ. And this morning I want to draw out the benefits of being a slave of Christ and the damage of being a slave of sin from James here, verse 1. If you would, please stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. As always, I'm just going to read the passage here. I'll say a prayer, and then you guys can be seated. James 1.1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Let's say a prayer. Father, I pray that this morning that your Word will be preached that we will make much of you, that you will show our hearts and our minds the damage that sin can do in our lives and the joy of being a servant of Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you will just draw out from your passage here, from your word, the benefits, the command to be a humble servant of Christ. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Since we're starting a new book, I certainly want to get into the author of the book and discuss who the author is. But given my message and given that I'm just focusing on verse 1, and I know that may seem strange because you read verse 1, it basically just seems like a greeting. Like, hey, how you doing? It's James. But I think there's a lot more here when we dig into it. And this morning what I want to do is I want to dig here, see if we can find some gold nuggets and see if that can apply to us. And as we work our way through the passage, I hope to draw out some of who the author is to help us better understand the author and the book, the letter that he is writing here. So my goal this morning is to draw out three observations from verse 1 here in James 1.1. The first observation that I have here this morning is this. James is giving us here a highlight of his humility. James here highlights his humility. Look again, very first of one. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, James here is just simply saying that he's a servant of God and of Christ. But the question that we all ask is, is well, who is James? I mean, who is this dude that's writing this book? What does this matter? One of the really important points about James describing himself in this way is that who James actually is, and he overlooks and he merely focuses in his, on his relationship with Christ. Most Protestant scholars and pastors and commentators think that James here, the James of this book, is actually the brother of Christ. The brother that's mentioned in Matthew 13, and Paul mentions him in Galatians 1.9. In other words, this is the half-brother of Jesus. So if you were to write a book and introduce yourself, would you introduce yourself in this way? Would you say so and so a servant of God and a humble or a, and a and a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ or a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? I can tell you this right now. If Amanda, my sister, were the Messiah, I'm telling everybody. I'm dropping the name like crazy, right? Oh yeah, my sister the Messiah, savior of the world. I'm doing it all the time, right? I mean, in our signatures, generally, we, we do want to sort of signify a little bit of who we are. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here by going to this slide here. Go to this one, Amanda. These are my two signatures here that I use. Both the top one is for my church email address. And as most of you know, I'm an adjunct professor at Midwestern Seminary. That's my, my um, signature for that email address. So notice what I put here, right? Sola de Gloria is just to God alone be the glory. Chad Meeks, Associate Pastor, Cedar Heights Baptist Church. Just giving you a sense of who I am, right? And then with my, with my um, school account, I put my credentials, my position, and then the institution itself. Just sort of straightforward, giving an indication of who I am. But if my sister were the Messiah, here's what I would say. Go ahead and go to the next slide here. It's hard to read this, but just follow along with me. If my sister were the Messiah, here's just what I'd say. Chad Meeks, brother of the Messiah, that is kin to the Queen of Queens, Princess of Peace, Lord of Lords, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who created everything, the all-powerful, all-knowing, the ever-kind, the Savior of all. Yeah, that lady, I'm her brother. I would be dropping the name like crazy, right? And you know what? So would you. We always like to talk about the famous people that we know, right? We always like to drop the names of, oh, yeah, the president told me the other day, or, yeah, this celebrity told me the other day. I happened to run into this movie star. We do it all the time, right? And if you were a sibling of the Messiah, it seems to me that most of us, when we started out, we would start out by saying, yeah, Jesus, the, or James, rather, the brother of Jesus, the Messiah. But that's not what James does here. And this is what's really interesting. What James does here is he highlights his servitude or his obedience, his allegiance to his brother, Jesus, the Messiah. And, it's, and we have a clear indication when you read through the Gospels. By the way, follow me here. I didn't note this in the first service. I want to note it here. We have a clear indication that James, at first, was not buying into this whole Jesus is the Messiah stuff at first. It may have been after the resurrection when James finally started buying into it. We don't know when, but there was certainly a point where he didn't get it. He didn't buy into it. And so then when he realizes that his, that his brother, his half-brother, is God, the creator of the world, when he's risen from the grave, he doesn't highlight his biological lineage here, he highlights his allegiance to the Messiah. I think that that's massively significant. I think that shows his humility. I think that shows that, look, he's saying this, what's important is, is that I am a servant of Christ, is that I serve Christ. Not that I am somehow linked to Jesus because we have the same mother. But I am a servant of Christ because I, am, I have been forgiven. I am a child of God. I am a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's huge here. Now, granted, our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters don't think that Jesus had brothers and sisters. But again, most Protestant scholars do think that Jesus did. And this seems to be his half-brother. I think, I think it's significant in this way. Follow me here. In our lives, 
especially being where we are here in America. And I know that I'm a cultural critic a lot. I'm not, it's not like I'm disgruntled with America or anything like that. But I think I need to highlight, contrast the way things should be with the way things are at times, okay? In our world, many times, we're told that to get ahead, we have to have this ego and this swagger, right? That if you want to get ahead, you got to talk the game, man. you got to play the right game. If you want to get ahead in this world, then you have to make sure that your name is known, that you get in front of the boss, and that the boss is going to give you that promotion. If you want to get ahead in this world, you got to make sure that you put yourself in the right spot, right? I mean, really, in all honesty, what we're told here in America is if you want to get ahead in the world, then you have to think of yourself and be a prideful human being. That's honestly what we're told. And here is James, that if anybody had any right to start name dropping, James would, but he doesn't. He just describes himself as a servant of Christ. You see, in life, we're one of two. You're either a servant of Christ or you're a slave to sin. And James gets that. And he understands the magnitude and the significance that he has in being free from the sin in his life. As a matter of fact, let's draw that out by highlighting the servitude aspect here. You can see James says, I'm a servant. The second observation that I have here is this. James classifies himself as a slave of Christ. So what I want to do here is I want to indicate the importance of being a slave to Christ. Every single human being that is not a follower of Jesus Christ, according to, and I read it earlier, Ephesians 2, is dead in their trespasses and sin. That's not just some Americans. That's not just some Europeans. That's not just the, East or the, the Western Hemisphere or the Northern Hemisphere. That is every single human being that is not a follower of Christ is a slave to sin. We are born dead in our trespasses and sins. As a matter of fact, generally speaking, whenever salvation is being de 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 described as an analogy, the analogy usually goes something like this, right? We're, we're in a storm-tossed sea, and we're barely keeping our head above water. And Jesus gets in his rowboat, and he rows out into the sea, and he throws us the life preserver, and all we got to do is reach out and grab it, and he pulls us back into the boat. That's the general analogy of salvation, but I think that that, I don't think that's a good analogy. Because if you're dead in your trespasses and sins, you're dead. And that Greek word for dead means dead. So I think a better analogy is one that's been given by many others. I certainly didn't make this up. And that analogy is this. You are dead at the bottom of the sea. You are dead in your trespasses and sin. And Jesus rows his boat out in this storm-tossed sea. He jumps down. He grabs your lifeless body from the depths of the sea of sin and destruction. And he hauls your body onto the boat. And he breathes new life into you. And your response is to breathe it in. That's a better description, I think, of our condition before Christ and after Christ. We like to think of sin at times as no big deal. Well, it's just, a, it's just a side thing I do. It's a little habit. It's not that big of a deal. You know, it's not really hurting my marriage. It's not hurting my life. It doesn't hurt my career. But we don't see that in Scripture. We see sin as a significant issue. And when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, and this is huge, and this is why it's important. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you are no longer a slave to the sin that is dragging you around like a dead doll. You are now a slave to Christ. You don't have to turn there, but Romans 6, verses 16 through 18, say, Paul says this. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Either sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. If you are no longer a slave to sin, it's because you've been freed from that sin, and now you are a slave to Christ. But I don't think that we always get that at times. When I was 12 and 13, I was a, a little bit of a cowboy. 
<laughs> I look really stupid in a hat, cowboy hat. But nonetheless, I was a cowboy, right? And my grandfather bought me a green broke horse. If you don't know what that is, that's a horse that's not really broke. I mean, it kind of was, but not really. So he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy you this horse. His name was Lightning. I'm going to buy you this horse. You train it, you break it, and then we'll sell it for more money. And then we'll buy another one. I was like, all right, cool. You know, I wanted to be a cowboy. But I hated that horse. I can remember one specific day, usually we, my grandfather lived up in the Quitman area, and we would go up there and we would ride with my uncle, my Uncle Gary, for those of you that knew him. And uh, Uncle Gary was taking us out on a ride that day. And I learned that day why pins should be round, why they're round pins and not square pins, because we didn't have a round pin. So to corral lightning, we had to corral him in a square pin. Well, eventually, we could tell right off the bat that he did not want to be caught. I mean, he was running all over the place, trying to run over us. It was just crazy. And so, so eventually, we got him into this square pen that was something like maybe 30 by 30, something like that. Maybe not even that big. And I had to put the halter and bridle on him. So I tried to walk up to him, and as soon as I walk up to him, he darts away, right? And my uncle's like, come on, boy, just get up there and grab him. Let's go. Now, when I was 12 or 13, I didn't even weigh 100 pounds yet. I was a little twig. I mean, grabbing this horse was a beast to me, right? And so eventually I get up there and I get my arms around this horse. And he starts dragging me up along the fence, running around with me. I mean, it was insane. Eventually I get the horse stopped. And my uncle helps me get the bridle on and get the saddle on. And I get on and I have spurs on at this point, right? Because I'm trying to train this horse. And I'm kicking this horse to start. But it's stuck in that stinking corner. It went around, pin, square, pin, stuck there. It wouldn't move. And so I'm yanking on his, you know, on the, on the uh, bridle here trying to get him to move. I'm kicking him with my spurs. And my uncle says, oh, I'll get him to move. <laughs> now, first of all, I'm thinking, no, 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 this is good. Let's just call it a day. I'm done. I was scared to death. Just to be quite honest with you, 12, 13, I was about to cry. All right? I was freaking out. My uncle goes into the barn, comes out with a whip and whips that horse, and that thing starts bucking around, rearing up, going crazy. I see him with the whip. As soon as I see the whip, I grab a hold of the horn, and I just hold on for dear life, just thinking maybe eventually he'll have pity on me and say, you can get off, we're done for the day. But that didn't happen. We eventually get lightning calmed down, and we start going out on our ride. And even on our ride, he had a tendency to rear his head back and slap you in the face. He reared his head back, bloodied my nose. I hated that stupid horse. And I remember after that episode, my, my uncle was talking to me about horses, and I was, I was upset. He could tell I was upset. I kind of wear my emotions on my sleeve, as you know. And He said, Chad, you know the thing about horses is, is that they are more powerful than you, but they don't know it. Yeah, they could, he could drag you all over the place. He could do all kinds of stuff to you, but he doesn't know that. You're smarter than him. And the thing about being freed from sin is that when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, that sin no longer has power over you. You have been given grace by God, not that you deserve it. It's not that you did anything to get it. It's not that you're worthy of it. The more that we lift up man and our ego, the more we lower the love and the compassion of Christ. But when we say, no, we're not worthy of salvation, we're not worthy of this freedom from sin. What we lift up is we lift up God. We say, God, in his mercy and in compassion, he gave us grace so that we could be free from this bondage that would eventually drag our souls into hell if we were not free. And many Christians don't realize that when you become a Christian, you become free by the grace of God, free from these sins. No, you're not perfect. But God gives us, by His grace, the Holy Spirit in us, we have, by His grace, the power to overcome. It's not you doing the work, it's God doing the work in you. But you have freedom if you are a slave to Christ. If you're willing to submit your life to Christ. If you're willing to give your all to Christ. The problem with sin. One of the most destructive things about sin is we don't know it's killing us until it's too late. We think it's no big deal, right? I can handle it. 
It's not destroying me, but sin by its very nature is meant to damn you. It isn't your friend. It isn't out for your good. It isn't meant to help you. It is meant to destroy you. But yet Christ in his love and in his grace and his mercy, he gives us freedom from that sin. But many times it's like we're sitting, we're sitting in the jail cell and the jail is unlocked and the fetters on our wrist are unlocked. The fetters on our legs are unlocked and we're just sitting there like we're in prison. And Christ walks in and he says, you're free. You're free. No, I've, I've still got these chains. I'm still in this prison. No, I freed you. Get off of those. What would you say to someone if you walked in a prison? And they stayed in that prison, even though the doors were open, and they stayed locked in those, or they, at least they kept those fetters on, even though they weren't locked on them. You would say this is an individual that has been institutionalized in such a way that they don't understand that the world outside is better than the world in the prison. And that's what we do as sinners at times, or, or as Christians at times. We're so bound by these, this sin, we don't realize that God has given us the grace to overcome it. We're free. We're free. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. You were dead. But if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a slave of Christ, you're no longer dead. Do you see this? I get it. In our independent culture, look, uh, it, I would be, you would, we would be hard-pressed to find someone that's as independent as me. I'm an independent guy. I like to be alone out in the woods to recharge. I don't always share my, 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 what I'm thinking. I could be in the CIA. I would have been an awesome CIA agent. I can keep secrets like nobody's business, right? I'm an independent guy. I get that. And in our independent culture, a lot of times, we don't like to think of the idea of being a servant of someone. We think, well, I want to be free. Do what I want to do. Here's the key. Here's the deal. And listen to me. This is important. Just given the nature of human beings and the nature of sin, you are either one or the other here. You are either a slave to sin or you are a slave to Christ. That's, that's just your nature. That's just reality. You can fight it, but you might as well fight gravity. You probably have more success there. God wants you to be free. We at Cedar Heights want you to be free. Let me conclude with this by going to my third point. It's my concluding point here. My third observation. Notice what James says. So he's a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the second part here. To the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. To the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Here's what's interesting about this. The 12 tribes of Israel no longer exist at this point. The 12 tribes of Israel haven't existed for almost 8,800 years at the point that James is writing this. So who in the world is he writing to when he says the 12 tribes of dispersion? See, in 722 BC, the Assyrians went in and they totally wiped out the 10 northern tribes of Israel. Wiped them out. We don't know where they are today. They may not exist. We don't know. Some of them may have gone to Arabia. Some of them may, may have been taken into Persia. We don't know where they are. So the only tribes that we knew existed were two. There's no, no such thing as 12. So what in the world is James talking about here when he says 12 tribes in the dispersion? I think James is highlighting the countercultural separate lifestyle that we're called to live, as, live in as followers of Jesus Christ. Let me, let me explain here. I think James is highlighting the fact that if indeed you are a follower of Jesus Christ, according to Galatians, according to Romans, so Paul even says this, I think James is highlighting, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are now sons of Israel. And yeah, there may no longer be the actual bloodline, 12 tribes of the Hebrews, but we have the spiritual line of the line of Christ. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you're part of this 12 tribes in the dispersion. What is going on with this dispersion? I think here is the main part where he's trying to show how the Christian lives this sort of separated life. 
again, in our culture, especially our culture, just our mindset, maybe this is a human mindset, it's not even with our culture, but we don't like this idea of being subjugated. I want to be free. I want my freedom. I don't want to think of myself as a servant of Christ, a slave of Christ. But that's not a biblical mindset. And the reality is, is that you may think you want to be free. You may think that you're not a servant of anyone, but you're a servant of either sin or Christ, one of the two. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, this is not your home. We're foreigners in this land. In the same way that the ten tribes of Israel were dispersed all over. We are part of the dispersion. We are foreigners in this land. This is not... This is not our home. And James here, I think, is tying together all of the idea that he has here. What he's saying is, is this. He's showing that we should be humble servants of Jesus Christ, following him. Indicating that to be a servant of Christ means you're not a slave to sin. And we may think, well, I don't want to be a servant. I want to be, I want to be different, but, or I, don't want, I want to be free. But the reality is, To be a follower of Jesus Christ is to live a separate, different life. A life of submission. A life of obedience. A life of dedication. That's the call of a Christian. And any other focus, any other lifestyle, you're just a slave to sin. You guys see this? So I ask you this question. This morning, are you a slave of sin or are you a slave of Christ? And furthermore, if indeed you are a slave to Christ, do you realize that he, not you, you haven't done it on your own. We can't do it. That he has given you the grace to overcome this sin. Do you realize that? Are you still sitting in the prison cell with fetters on your wrists and the jail cell open? I pray you're slaves of Christ and find out that there's actually freedom in that servitude. Let's pray. Father, probably one of the hardest things about being a follower of you is that we must deny ourselves. And in a world where we're constantly told to think about ourselves, put ourselves number one, that we've got to up our brand, that we've got to get our name out there. Such a mindset is contrary to what we see in Scripture. It's contrary to what we see James, who is the leader of the church in Jerusalem and the half-brother of Jesus. It's contrary to the way that he acted. Help us to be humble servants of you so that we may be free of sin and living the abundant life you promise. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. Stand and sing with us, if you will. Chuck and I will be up here as always. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow with ceaseless praise. Take my
Oh.